Welcome to another SME Media Webinar. Our topic today is From High Pressure Heat Treatment to High Performance Parts. And our sponsor today is Quintus Technologies. Hello, I'm your host, Alan Rooks, Editor-in-Chief of Manufacturing Engineering Magazine, which is published by SME Media. I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, Magnus Allfors of Quintus Technologies. Magnus is an application special, specialist who has worked with Quintus Technologies since 2013. As an applications engineer for hot isostatic pressing, he is heavily involved in the development and optimization of HIP processes for different industries, especially the AM industry. As Magnus delivers his presentation, you'll be able to ask questions using the Q&A box that appears at the right of your screen. Time permitting, your questions will be answered following the presentations. If time runs out before we can get to all of the questions, we will make sure the answers are emailed to you. We could run long and go past the top of the hour by as much as 30 minutes. If we do, we hope you can remain with us. If you can't, you'll receive an email later telling you how you can view the entire presentation. And if you experience any audio or visual difficulty during the live presentation, please let us know via the Q&A app. Also, if you have questions about any other aspects of our webinars, please email me at arooks at sme.org. So let's begin. One of the challenges in additive manufacturing is producing higher performance parts, eliminating defects, reducing scatter, and improving material properties. A key method of accomplishing these goals is hot isostatic pressing, as we mentioned, or HIP. With the latest HIP equipment, the process can handle the full post-heat treatment process for AM parts, called high-pressure heat treatment. This, te uh, excuse me, this technology makes HIP technology a very cost-effective, safe, and easy-to-use technology for additive manufacturing. In this webinar, Magnus will present an introduction to Quintus Technologies, Fundamentals of Hot Isostatic Pressing, HIP for Metal Additive Manufacturing, and Case Studies for AM and HPHT. So, Magnus, take it away. Okay, thank you, Alan. And uh, thank you for covering the outline as well. I will go straight into a short introduction of Quintus Technologies then. So, here we can see the timeline of our company. So our operation started in the 1940s when a high pressure uh, department was formed at the company called ASEA. Uh, ASEA is today known as ABB that you might know of. However, we are not a part of an, an ABB anymore. In 1947, ASEA started to look at how to manufacture diamonds, and in 1953, they were able to produce the world's first synthetical diamonds, and to, to achieve that, a high-pressure press was used. The high-pressure technology developed for manufacturing of diamonds was, in 1964, used to develop presses for cold and hot isostatic pressing, which became commercial processes. Since then, we have done a lot of uh, innovation of our products. For example, we have invented the rapid cooling and rapid quenching hip furnace. We have built the largest hip and zip systems in the world many times. Uh, the largest hip, hip system available today, we built in 2010. Since 2017, we are owned by Kobe Steel Group of Japan. Today, we are around 240 employees worldwide. We have our headquarters in Vestero, Sweden. We have a, Shang a site in Shanghai to cover the Asian market. And then we also have a site in Columbus, Ohio, covering the North American market. And this is where I'm based. Since the 1950s, we have delivered over 1,800 high-pressure systems worldwide. And our history of innovation have resulted in a lot of patents, uh, which of 120 are still active today. So now I want to talk a little bit about the fundamentals of hot isostatic pressing. So there are a few different applications for hipping. Uh, one of them is diffusion bonding, where you can bond similar or dissimilar materials together in the solid state. Uh, 
Another one is consolidation of powder, where you can produce near net shaped components by a uh, hipping encapsulated metal powder. A third one, the one that we will be focusing on today, is what we call densification of products. Uh, this is a, a process when you use hipping to eliminate internal defects such as porosity in materials. Uh, this is commonly, commonly used for castings, uh, additive manufactured components, any type of sintered materials, uh, etc. And the purpose is to improve the quality and the material properties of the parts. The, the definition of hipping is to apply a pressure distinctly higher than the yield strength of the material at the hip temperature. So it is a, a, a process with high temperature and high pressure. We can go up to 30,000 psi and 3,600 Fahrenheit in the process. And at this high temperature, the yield strength of the material will be very low. And the stresses that we induce in the components by the pressure will actually be higher than the yield strength. And as we know, when we have higher stresses than the yield strength, the material will, be, will plastically deform to, for example, collapse porosity in an uh, additive manufactured material. So the mechanisms that are working during the process is mechanical deformation that I just described. However, we do not only want to collapse the pores in the material, we want to completely metallurgically heal them. And that is where the creep and diffusion part of the process comes in. So we can completely erase these defects from the material's microstructure. And this is also why we have a soak time in our HIP process. Isostatic pressure is when the pressure when a pressure is acting on all surfaces on all directions of an object. And in the HIP process, we achieve this by a uh, pressurized argon gas. So now I will cover HIP for additive manufactured materials specifically. So as we know, most of the ad, uh, metal additive manufacturing technologies will have some internal defects in the as-printed condition. It can be lack of fusion between the layers, it can be gas porosity from the powder particle themselves, uh, and it, uh, for example, for binder jet, it can be a residual sintering porosity. And what these defects do is that they will act as stress concentration and crack initiation points in the material. And this will uh, negatively influence your material properties. So the main purpose of hipping is to eliminate these defects, to eliminate the stress concentration and crack initiation points, uh, and this will improve the material properties. Uh, and the main properties that will be improved by hipping is ductility and fracture toughness, better creep property, and especially increased fatigue properties. Also, since there will be a natural variation in, in defects between different printed components or samples, for example, in the amount of porosity, the size, shape, distribution, etc., there will also be a variation in the properties between different components. And since we're eliminating all these defects with the HIP process, we often see a reduced scatter in the properties with HIP. Uh, so we get more predictive material properties, so we hopefully can use design values closer to the actual strength of the material. Uh, hipping can also be used to improve the quality of machine and polished surfaces. Uh, we can see down on the right here we have a picture of a tube. Uh, this is a cast tube, but it shows a good example. And in the left picture we have a cast tube and they've uh, machined the inner surface. And here we can see that we have revealed some of the internal porosity in the machine surface, uh, so it's not a great surface here. Uh, the picture on the right, we have the same type of cast tube, but this one has been hipped before machining. And since we have eliminated all the internal defect, we can see that nothing comes up in the machine surface and we have a, a virtually perfect surface. So this is quite important when it comes to any type of sealing application. Uh, also improved corrosion properties, optical properties, and aesthetical properties. So hipping is actually used within the jewelry industry and luxury watch industry today. They don't really need to improve material properties, but they require perfect surfaces, and that's why they use the hip process. One thing I want to point out as well is that strength is mainly determined by the microstructure of a material and not the defect. So the the poor uh, the defect elimination part of the hip process doesn't really contribute to any strength increase of a material. However, you can do heat treatments in the hip process and, and thus uh, affect the microstructure and then increase your your strength. But uh, 
the elimination of defect doesn't really affect the strength of a material. Here we can just see an example of uh, a defect elimination by hipping for different additive manufacturing technologies. So on the top row here, we have the as deposit uh, uh, condition where we see some internal uh, porosity and defects for powder bed fusion, direct energy deposition, and binder jet. On the lower row, we have the same type of material, but that has been hipped, and we can see that we can eliminate these kind of defects with the hip process. Here's an example of the improvement of fatigue properties with the HIP process. So this is for an electron beam powder bed fusion printed titanium 6-4 material. We can see on the uh, lower part of the diagram, uh, we have the as printed material data. And above that, we have the material data for the same material that has been HIP. Uh, and to compare these curves, I put a line here on 600 megapascal amplitude stress. So at, if we look at the as-printed material with this stress, we can achieve around 90,000 cycles until failure. Uh, and if we look at the hip material for the same stress, we will get around 4 million cycles until failure. So this is a big improvement of the fatigue life, and this is one of the main purposes of using hipping for additive manufactured uh, material. One thing to notice is that it's only internal defects that will be eliminated by the HIP process. So any surface connected feature, such as a surface crack, for example, will not be eliminated by HIPing because the pressure medium, the argon gas, will just penetrate this feature and there will be no net force to, to close that one. Uh, so a gas tight surface of your component is required. And this is typically not an issue for powder bed fusion, direct energy deposition, etc. If we look at binder jet, the material has to be sintered to high enough density for where the porosity goes from a connecting characteristic to a more isolated characteristic. And for the typical powders used for powder bed uh, for binder jet, uh, this threshold density is around 92% uh, density. So at this threshold, the porosity goes for, to a more isolated uh, characteristics above that. Uh, since we are densifying the material, we have a theoretical shrinkage on the component as well. And this shrinkage will correspond to the amount of densification we are achieving. So, for example, if we have 1% porosity in the material and we hip that to 100% density, we will get a shrinkage by volume of 1% of our component. And 1% shrinkage by volume, that corresponds to 0.33% linear direction in uh, linear shrinkage in each direction. So typically, it's very hard to even measure the, the shrinkage of an AM component after hipping. Looking a bit closer at the hip cycle parameters, the hip temperature that's typically used is around 80% of the melting point. Uh, that is the solidus temperature of the material, with some uh, exceptions. <laughs> Typical pressures ranging from 15 to 30,000 psi, somewhat depending on the strength of the material. Uh, for most metals, a two-hour soak time is good enough to uh, achieve complete densification of the material. However, when we look at materials designed for high temperature creep resistance, such as the nickel-based superalloys or titanium aluminide, in those cases, we have to go to a little bit longer soak time, such as four hours, since <clears throat> high temperature creep is pretty much what we're trying to achieve in the HIP process. <clears throat> And uh, as I already say, the main, main purpose with hipping is to get to 100% density. And there will be different combinations possible of temperature, pressure, and time that will give you this 100% dense material. So there will be different options, and which of those different hip cycles you would choose is normally determined by other factors. For example, say that we want to minimize the grain growth in our process, then we would choose a hip temperature as low as possible and a soak time as short as possible, and then we might have to compensate with maximizing the pressure. Another example is that we might want to avoid or promote a phase transformation to happen, and uh, we would adjust our hip temperature according to that. 
Now I want to go through a case study that we did a few years ago with, together with ARCAM, where we looked at hip, different HIP parameters for EBM TIE 64. And I think this case study is pretty good because it shows a good relationship between processing, microstructure, and properties. So ORCAM, they had been trying out the HIP process a little bit uh, in their R&D, and they saw the, the typical benefits with improved fatigue properties, ductility, reduction in scattering, etc. However, they also saw a decrease in the yield strength of the material, and that was something they didn't really like. And uh, on the right here, we can see an example of this. This is for laser powder bed fusion, but it shows a good example. So the blue curve here, we can see the, the strength uh, of the as-built material. And then the gray dashed line is the same material that's been hipped with uh, the standard hip cycle. And as we can see, we have a much better ductility, but we also have a significant drop in the yield strength. So this is something we wanted to address by making a study of, of hip parameters. And why do we get this reduction in strength of the material when we hip it? So in the powder bed fusion process, we have these very high solidification rates. And this gives us a very fine microstructure, which gives us relatively high strength of, of our material in the as-printed condition. And any type of elevated temperature treatment, such as the HIP process, uh, will coarsen this microstructure. And the, this will result in a decreased yield strength. On the, on the uh, bottom part of this slide, we can see uh, as printed material and the same material after hipping. So the microstructure is pretty much the same, but it's just coarsened uh, with the hip cycle. And the typical practice today, so the ASTM standard for powder bed fusion TIE 64 is called 2924. And we can see the parameters for hipping allowed by this standard on the top row here. And the typical HIP cycle used within this standard is 920 Celsius, 100 megapascal, and two hours. So this is what we're using in the AM community today. However, this cycle was developed over 30 years ago for CAST TIE 64. So one question is, 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 are these parameters really optimal for powder bed fusion materials since casting and powder bed fusion microstructure are relatively different? Here we can see the test matrix of our study. And our approach was to look at, at the lower hip temperatures to try to affect the microstructure less and try to keep more of the, the high uh, as printed strength. So we have the, the typical hip cycle at 920 Celsius as a reference. And then we were looking all the way down to 800 Celsius as hip temperature. And of course, uh, in the study was still a requirement to achieve 100% densification of our samples, since uh, uh, you can't lower the hip temperature too much because then you won't uh, have the full densification in the end. And here we can see the results of this study in terms of the yield strength and the elongation. And if we look at the diagram for the yield strength, on the very left, we, have this, we can see the strength for the as-built material. And then if we jump one step to the right, we have the bars uh, corresponding to the yield strength of the material that has been hipped with the standard hip cycle at 920 Celsius. And as we can see, we have this significantly, uh, significant drop in yield strength as we was, uh, were expecting. But then when we move to the right in this diagram, we have decreasing hip temperatures. And we can see with the decreasing hip temperatures, we have an increasing yield strength. So, at 800 Celsius, we can see that we have a significantly higher yield strength than the standard hip cycle normally used. And at 800 Celsius and 100 megapascal, we saw that we got some tendencies that we didn't achieve full densification. So we also added a variant with 800 Celsius and 200 megapascal, the double pressure, which is the maximum pressure. And then we saw that we got complete full densification and also this high strength. The elongation, as we can see, is pretty much the same for all the different hip variants. So some short conclusion from this study was that just by tweaking the hip parameters, we could get the higher strength of our EBM TIE 64 after hip. And this was the cycle that we thought gave the best overall material properties.
on a more general uh, level, we can say that powder bed fusion is something different from many, uh, conventional casting, wrought materials, etc. So it might not be optimal to copy the HIP and heat treatment specifications from those industries, apply, apply to powder bed fusion and think that we will get the, the most optimal properties out of the material. <clears throat> We have, we have done a study, the same type of study with laser powder bed fusion as well, and we saw the same results there. Now I want to discuss an interesting approach for powder bed fusion, where you have a possibility to increase the process speed and reduce the thermal stresses uh, by using HIP. So hot isostatic pressing will give you 100% density of your material independent of the starting density. So to the HIP process, it doesn't matter if you have 1% or 5% porosity in the material. As long as you have a gas tight surface, this material will densify to 100% density. So uh, if we know that we're going to HIP or we decide that we're going to HIP, we can allow a higher amount of porosity in the as printed condition if we have uh, decided to HIP. So there's no need to print to 99.9% .9 density since uh, you will eliminate all the porosity anyway with the HIP process. Uh, an extreme example of this is when you just uh, print a, a HIP canister. So you just print the shell in the EBM process and you keep the powder inside completely unprinted. So this is a, a, a sample which would have around 65% density, thus 35% porosity, and this is easily hit to 100% density. So if we can allow a higher amount of porosity in the as-printed condition, uh, this results that we can also use less energy input in our printing process. And uh, uh, by doing this, we can also increase the scan speeds in the process and the line offset and hatch spacing in the, in the process. So this will give you a faster printing process and increase productivity. And this is very good, especially for, for powder bed fusion, since it's a relatively slow process today. Also, by using less energy input in the printing process, we can, uh, you will reduce the thermal stresses in your part, especially for the laser-based powder bed fusion. Uh, and this can reduce the work with thermal management, like uh, uh, build supports, etc. Here we can see a graph uh, that is from a study performed by Dr. Dominic Ahlers at Paderborn University in Germany. Uh, and in this study, they were looking at printing material with different uh, energy inputs. We can see the energy inputs on the x-axis here with the decreasing values to the right. The blue bars in this graph uh, corresponds to the density of uh, the material in the as-printed condition. And then the red bars is the density after hipping. The black curve here is the time reduction that they did in the printing process by printing with less energy inputs. So for example, if we look at the bars on the very right here with the lowest energy input, we can see that the material has a density of ni around 94% density as printed. However, we can hip it to 100% density as we see here, and by printing with this uh, energy input, they were able to say to reduce the printing time with over 50%. Uh, so this is quite interesting. Uh, Dominic Alish is still working on this study. He's looking at the mechanical properties and fatigue properties of these variants now. So that will be very interesting to see soon. Uh, and now I want to discuss something we call high pressure heat treatment. So. Historically, HIP units had very slow cooling rates. Uh, the cooling was just made by shutting off the furnace and letting the system cool down by itself. It could take many, many hours. So any type of conventional heat treatment was not able to do in the HIP process because of these slow cooling rates. So that was done in more conventional heat treatment equipment like vacuum furnaces, etc. However, a modern HIP system today can achieve very high cooling rates. So this makes it possible to uh, perform in situ heat treatment in the HIP cycle, in the HIP system at the same time. So today we can not only uh, use the HIP process for densification, we can also use it to modify our microstructures for the desired properties. So here we can see an example of a conventional post-processing route for an additive manufactured uh, component, for example. 
So we might have a stress relief step first, uh, then we have a, our hip cycle to eliminate the porosity. We have our slow cooling rate here. And uh, then we probably have some kind of solution treatment with rapid cooling or quenching, and then uh, typically uh, aging or tempering step to, to set the, the final uh, microstructure and properties. Uh, and thus the main purpose of high pressure heat treatment is to combine these steps uh, together to run in one equipment in one cycle uh, to, to remove process steps uh, uh, pretty much. So by doing this, it's possible to reduce the cycle time the downtime between the, the steps and thus the lead time for the whole process. Uh, since we're not heating up and cooling down the material as many times, we can also reduce the energy consumption in the post-processing. And if we look on a more materials uh, uh, perspective, uh, in the conventional uh, post-processing cycle that we see on the bottom here, we might have a, a two-hour soak time in the hip cycle and then another two-hour soak time in the solutionizing step. And of course, if we combine these together in high pressure heat treatment, we spend two hours at temperature instead of four hours at, at high temperature, uh, which can be very uh, important when we want to minimize grain growth, for example. So here we have a, an example of a commercially uh, used high pressure heat treatment case today. So this is for cobalt chrome F75. And the specification on the right here I've taken from Arcam's website. So these are their post-processing recommendations for their cobalt chrome materials. So they recommend a hip cycle at 1200 Celsius for four hours soak time. And then after this, they recommend a homogenization step in a vacuum furnace at the similar temperature, also four hours soak time. And then they have a requirement on the cooling rate. And this cooling rate corresponds to 105 Fahrenheit per minute. Uh, and this is to avoid the uh, uh, carbide formation during the cooling. And 105 Fahrenheit per minute can easily be achieved in a modern HIP system today. So it makes very much sense to combine these two steps together. So you would perform one cycle instead of two, use one equipment instead of two, and spend four hours at temperature instead of eight hours at temperature. Now we're going to look a little bit on the equipment for high pressure heat treatment. So here we can ha see uh, an example of a modern HIP system. This is a product we call the QIH48URQ. We can see the hot zone size here. We can process uh, 550 pounds of material in this machine every cycle. Uh, and this is a, a good size uh, HIP system for a typical uh, additive manufacturing production case. And in this type of system, we can achieve up to 8,000 Fahrenheit per minute in the gas. So very, very fast gas cooling or quenching. And it's not only high cooling rates that can be achieved in a modern HIP system. They also offer a high degree of flexibility. So you can tailor make your heat treatment recipe with different soaking, uh, heating, cooling, and quenching step, steps. And we can see an example in this graph here. So this is uh, the uh, actual log data from a combined HIP and hardening cycle for uh, additive manufactured tool steel. So we start our cycle as a normal HIP cycle by ramping up the temperature and pressure. Then we have our soak time for a few hours. Then we increase the temperature just a little bit just before quenching down to room temperature. And then we have this up and down three time tempering of this material. And we can also combine control slow cooling and rapid cooling in different ways in the hip, uh, in modern hip system. And you can also stop the quenching at any predefined temperature in the cycle. So we can see here on the right, we have uh, fast gas quenching, and then we stop it, and it turns into around 1200 Fahrenheit in this case. So we don't have to cool down to room temperature. We can stop it at, at any temperature. And some benefits with high pressure heat treatment. So uh, one thing to notice is that the high pressure we have in the HIP process remains during the cooling and the heat treatment. And when we have this very highly pressurized argon, it also gets a very high density of the gas. And this gives us a very high thermal conductivity, which results in a very high heat transfer between the components and our cooling medium. And that is very good for heat treatment. 
Also compared to more conventional quenching processes such as water quenching or oil quenching where you have a, a, a very hot component that you drop into a much colder medium, you, got this, uh, you get this thermal shock initially. In our process, we have the cooling medium and the components start at the same temperature and then we start to cool the medium and the parts will follow. So it is a little bit uh, of a more softer quenching method. So you will have lower thermal gradients, lower thermal stresses, and a lower risk of crack and distortion of your components. And in the HIP process, we have the same chamber for heating, soaking, and cooling, etc. So the components stay in the exact same position uh, over the whole cycle. And this makes it easy to uh, monitor the temperature during the process. So on the Bottom right here, we can see a picture. Uh, this is our smallest uh, quenching hip furnace we have in our Swedish lab. And uh, here we have a, a rather large cylind cylindrical specimen in the furnace. And I put thermocouples here around the components in the gas. I also have one ther thermocouple on the surface of the component. And then we have a thermocouple in the thermal center of the of this sample. So we can measure the exact cooling rate in different parts of the component during the cycle. So this is very good when it comes to research and the process validation, etc. Also, since we're performing the heat treatment under pressure, there's no risk of thermally induced porosity or tip. And uh, now I want to go through a few real case examples of high pressure heat treatment. So these are mainly experiments that we have done in our HIP labs uh, together with partners, uh, at least the ones that we're allowed to show. So just to start with, here we can see an example uh, of combined HIP and heat treatment of Inconel 718. So we have combined the, the standard HIP cycle according to an ASTM standard with the standard age hardening of this material governed by the AMS uh, standard. And we can see the log data here on the left. One thing to note is, is that uh, in this case we have done the 18 hour plus aging, aging in the hip, uh, in the hip uh, unit. However, it is also possible to take out the parts after the quenching or, or cooling and do the aging in another type of furnace if that uh, is more uh, economical in some cases. On the right here, we have the hardness results of this uh, combined cycle. Uh, so the blue bars on the left, we have the as-built hardness. They vary a little bit depending on where the sample was on the build plate. After just a standard hip cycle, we can see we have the same hardness for all materials, but it's very low. And then on the, the three right bars here, we have the combined hip and heat treatment, high hardness and a low scatter. Here's an, another example, which is uh, uh, electron powder bed fusion printed titanium aluminide. And this material, you can get different microstructure depending on how you cool it. So if you cool it slowly, you will get an equax microstructure, as we can see on the left here. In the middle picture, we see a laminar microstructure, where you, which you achieve by a fast cooling. And to the right here, we get, can get a duplex microstructure, so a mix between equax and duplex. Uh, uh, equiax and laminar, which you achieve with the intermediate cooling rate. And in this case, we wanted to get the duplex microstructure for uh, the best creep properties. And we saw that we had to be very, very accurate when it came to the cooling rate. We, have to be, we had to be within plus minus 10 Fahrenheit per minute in the cooling rate to be able to achieve the, the correct microstructure, as we can see on the right here. Uh, but this was possible to, to achieve in the HIP system. Here we can see a programmed cooling rate of 90 Fahrenheit per minute. And we have the thermocouples from the top, bottom, and middle of the furnace. And uh, they are all very, very accurate uh, along this programmed cooling uh, rate. Uh, another example is, uh, uh, in this case, this is actually a cast material, but it shows a good example. So this is a nickel-based single crystal material. And this is a study performed by Un uh, Ruhr University of Bochum in Germany, where they've been looking at a material called Erbo-1. And uh, they have, uh, this university have a HIP system with rapid quenching capability from us. So in this study, they looked at this material and they looked at the con uh, conventional heat treatment of this material performed in a vacuum furnace. 
And then they also looked at the combined hip and heat treatment done in the hip system with rapid cooling uh, in the hip. So in the test matrix here on the lower left, we can see the, the, how the heat treatment looks like. So we have a solution anneal for a few hours, then we cool down to room temperature, and then there's a, two tem a dual step aging at two different temperatures. And the cooling rates achieved in the conventional cycle in the vacuum furnace were in the magnitude of 270 Fahrenheit per minute. The same heat treatment was performed in the HIP system as well, with the uh, difference that we also had the, uh, the high pressure of 15,000 PSI. And also in the HIP system, the cooling rates we achieved were one mi magnitude higher, so around 2,700 uh, Fahrenheit per minute. We can see the combined HIP and heat treatment uh, log data here on the right as well. And here we can see the results of these two trials in terms of the microstructures. So on the left, we have the microstructure uh, resulting from the conventional heat treatment. And on the right, we have the combined HIP and heat treatment material. So we can see that we got the same uh, volume fraction of gamma prime here, around 75%, uh, which is what we expect. However, we can see in the combined HIP and heat treatment case, we get a much finer gamma gamma prime microstructure. And this is due to the faster, much faster cooling rate after solution annealing in the HIP uh, unit. And here we can see what these microstructure re results in terms of uh, creep properties. So we have, they did trials with, uh, with creep on different temperatures and uh, stresses. And we can see in both cases, the combined HIP and heat treated material outperforms the conventionally heat treated material. And the reason for this is that uh, is due to the reduction in the amount and size of the porosity. And also that we get this finer gamma gamma prime microstructure from the higher cooling rates in the HIP cycle. And now I want to cover uh, something. So the distinct difference between conventional heat treatment and heat treating in the hip is the uh, high external pressure we have in the hip process. And we have seen that this external pressure acting on the components can actually change some of the thermodynamics of the materials. So in one case, we wanted to see if uh, the hip pressure can influence the phase transformation genetics of a steel. So we did the trials with the TTT diagram approach where we austenized the material, we cooled it down to an isothermal temperature corresponding to the perlite nose, and we kept the material there for different uh, times uh, in different experiments. And we did these exact same thermal profiles for uh, a minimum pressure in the HIP system and a maximum uh, uh, pressure in the HIP system. And then we analyzed the microstructure and the hardness to see the difference. And this was done on a steel called 4340 or 2541. And here we can see the results in terms of microstructure and hardness. So at an isothermal temperature of 2000 seconds, this is the resulting microstructure we have uh, on the left here. We have a uh, perlite and we have our Martin site because it's uh, a partial transformation of the perlite. 70% perlite. 344 vickers of hardness. If we look on the right picture here, this is a material that's been treated with the exact same thermal profile, however, at a high external pressure, uh, at a higher pressure. So uh, 170 megapascal compared to 10 megapascal. And in this case, we can see that we have much more martensite, much less uh, perlite. It's 26% uh, per perlite compared to 70. And also we get a, uh, an increase in the hardness uh, corresponding to this. So in this uh, study, we could conclude that uh, the hip pressures are high enough to actually change the, the phase, transformati phase transformation genetics of this steel, which is very interesting. Another study we made was to uh, combine the HIP and H hardening for 17,4 pH. Uh, in this case, we also did the full heat treatment, including the agent in the HIP cycle. And we also did the same, but in a conventional vacuum furnace with water quenching. So the same type of heat treatment, but with pressure and without pressure. And we can see the, we can see the resulting um, 
hip cycle up on the right here, and we can also see the resulting hardness in the in the matrix uh, uh, on the left here. So we can see that with material treated in the hip cycle under pressure, we get a 40 Vickers hardness material, both in the asquens condition and in the aged condition. So this was pretty interesting that we got a, a harder and stronger material just by doing the same process in the hip system under pressure. And the reason for this is actually that the high external pressure acting on the part will promote the more cri closed crist uh, packed crystalline structure. And uh, martensite is less uh, close packed than austenite, so the pressure is actually stabilizing the austenite, which means that the martensite start temperature is pushed towards uh, lower temperatures. And when we are then forming the martensite at lower temperature, that martensite will result in harder and, uh, and uh, stronger. And uh, now I'm just going to summarize what I've been talking about here today. So we saw that HIP will give you improved material properties for metal additive manufactured material. For example, you get improved fatigue properties, creep, ductility, fracture toughness, and uh, a reduction of these properties as well. We've also seen that the standard HIP cycle might not always be optimal for additive manufacturing. So there is definitely possibilities to optimize HIP cycle for powder bed fusion or binder jet, et cetera, to get the optimal results out of it. So uh, the, the, the HIP and heat treatment processes used for casting or forgings might not be optimal for additive manufacturing, which is something new. Uh, we have also seen that HIP makes it possible uh, to speed up the uh, speed up the powder bed fusion production rate in case we can allow a higher amount of porosity in the as printed condition, and this will also reduce the thermal stresses in the build process. Uh, we saw that high pressure heat treatment is when we combine hipping and heat, heat treatment together in one cycle in one equipment, the HIP. And this makes it possible to reduce cycle time, lead time, energy consumption, consumption, consumption by eliminating process steps. So that was pretty much the technical uh, part of this webinar. So this webinar has been recorded and it will be uh, available uh, by, via AS, AS, SME and also it will be available on Quintus Technologies uh, YouTube channel. I also want to mention that uh, the whole Quintus team, uh, including myself, we will be at uh, RAPID in May. Uh, our booth number is going to be 541, so you are all, all very welcome to combine, uh, to come by and uh, ask questions and discuss more hipping for additive manufactured material. And if you want to have a more separate sit-down meeting, it's also possible to uh, pre-book a meeting in the, in the email address we can see here on the bottom. So with that, I thank you all very much for listening, and uh, we'll see if we have any questions to answer. Well, great, Magnus. Uh, this is Alan Rooks again joining you. Uh, Magnus, thanks for your insights into hot isostatic pressing and how it is enabling additive manufacturing. Uh, we have received a few questions, so it would be nice to try to get to all of them. So let's start with this one. Does the transformation phase diagram for martensite also affect the potential results for bannite at a lower temperature as well? Yeah, possibly. So, uh, I mean, all the phase diagrams, the TTT diagram, CCT diagrams, et cetera, that's out there, it's for atmospheric pressure. And now we're adding a, a fourth uh, dimension to the heat treatment by adding this pressure. So. We have just seen a few of these effects when we have doing trials uh, that, that the pressure do, uh, do affect uh, the, the thermodynamics. And there are some old literature on this as well, uh, mainly for geological studies at, at very high pressure. So I don't really know, and I think nobody really knows. I think it's an interesting field where a lot of research could be done to see how can we use the pressure to, you know, uh, affect the material in a way that we want to, that we can't do with the temperature and time and cooling rates, et cetera, that we normally use in heat treatment. 
So I, I can't really answer that specific question more than that. I, I, we don't know. I don't think anybody really knows. Okay. Well, thanks for that answer. Uh, our next question is, can we use this process to increase the hardness welding between 304 to 304 material? Uh, to increase welding, I mean, what it the main uh, thing that it does is to eliminate pores and defects. So you might be uh, able, if you have any of those, like porosities or, or shrinkage pores or shrinkage crack in your welds, uh, then it will uh, might be able to help that uh, that issue. Yes. Okay, great. But uh, I mean, uh, hipping for welding. Uh, I don't know too many applications where hipping is just used for, for improving welds. Gotcha. Okay, we have another question that just came in, uh, and that is, can you explain how the argon atmosphere used in laser PBF of titanium affects the healing of the, of the hip cycle? Uh, yeah. I was TI, yeah. I'm assuming that's titanium, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, and I think so. So, so one thing uh, that uh, will affect the hip response is if you have something in the pores uh, that you want to eliminate. For example, gas. So you can have air or nitrogen, hydrogen, etc. Those will all diffuse into the materials matrix, and the pores will completely disappear. Uh, one uh, distinct difference with argon is that it's an inert gas and it's a big molecule, so that will actually not diffuse into the material. So when you hit porosity with argon inside, you will decrease the size of that pore, and uh, the, but the argon will not escape. It will not diffuse away in, into the material. So you will actually have a smaller pore, a much smaller pore, but with high, high pressure argon inside. So that is the difference between argon and other gases in inside uh, inside the defects. So, and it also depends, you know, on on do you have a nitrogen atomized powder or do you have an argon atomized powder? Uh, also, between laser based and EBM based uh, powder bed fusion in uh, electron beam, you have a vacuum, so lack of fusion there will be on the vacuum. But if you get them in the laser based process, those lack of fusion will be under argon. Uh, so, but I mean, there there will be we we do see the the reduction of those the size of those um, uh, defects are so much. So we do see the big improvement of fatigue properties, for example, even for uh, material containing argon. Oh, great! Thanks for that explanation, and uh, thanks to our audience for these great questions. We have another one that's just come in. Um, and that is, uh, can an, I'm sorry, can an external sheath be used to help heal surface defects? Uh, yes, it, yes, it could. So there are different uh, different application of hipping where you encapsulate material. So the most extreme one would be just encapsulating powder, and you can hip that to 100%. And the same goes for you know surface ca cracks, for example. Uh, that's uh, used in welding sometimes. That you weld uh, you weld together the surface connected crack. So you, now you have an internal crack, and then you can hip that and eliminate it. So uh, it can be done, but you, you you have to seal off that surface connected defect somehow, uh, either either if it's welding or or whatever it might be, or a sheet. So I Great. guess that's uh, for the hip process. It's it's pretty easy, but uh, I think the challenge is how to seal seal off that surface connected feature in in a effective way. Excellent. Okay, our next question is, uh, do you typically have to add a percentage of extra material for the filling of the void slash defects? Uh, no. When it comes to powder bed fusion, no. I mean, the the, the shrinkage in, of the hip process, since you don't have that much porosity in, in the material as printed, the shrinkage of the part is, uh, I mean, I've never been able to measure even the, the shrinkage of, of that part. Uh, if we look at binder jet, for example, which can contain more porosity, uh, 
Uh, and they also have, uh, that, so for example, if you have 5% porosity in your uh, binder jet material after sintering, and then you hit it to 100% density, you will have a shrinkage by 5%, and that can affect, you know, your part to be out of tolerance, et cetera. Uh, so in that case, you need to take uh, into account when you design your printing if you're going to hip or if you're going to sinter, et cetera. And that, that's something they already do today because they have uh, around 20% shrinkage in the, in the sintering process. So they know if they know what, what final density they will go to, if it's 95 or 96 or 100 by hip, then they can easily calculate what, what the green part, uh, how big that one should be. Terrific. All right, let's see. Um, this, our next question is, can hipping cause volumetric defects to become linear flaws? Uh, yeah, I guess. So. I mean, it, it will, uh, uh, volumetric, uh, say a sphere, a spherical pore, when we do hip it, it will collapse somehow. Uh, and I guess it depends on if it will be a crack or if it just will be a smaller sphere uh, or however it would look like. But typically the hip process will uh, make it, say it goes from a, a sphere to a, to a planar defect, uh, but then with the soak time and the creep and diffusion, that planar defect will completely disappear. So if you go from a sphere to a, a two-dimensional defect, Instead, you haven't really achieved what you want in your hip process, which is complete uh, elimination of, of these defects. Okay, terrific. Uh, all right, uh, our next question. Is high pressure heat treatment a commercially available process? Uh, yes, you, yeah, you can say that. Uh, there are heat treaters that are doing it commercially today. And for, uh, if we talk more of the additive manufacturing industry, smaller parts, different requirements. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, service bureau Syntavia, they have a HIP system which has possibility to run high pressure heat treatment. Ehrlichon AM, they have a HIP system which are, are possible to do high pressure heat treatment in. Uh, there will be a new HIP service provider in this year in September, a company called Paolo. They will have a relatively small uh, hip system for being a, a hip service provider which can also which also have the capabilities to run high pressure heat treatment in so uh, you can you can get it uh, commercially today yes all right great um, well why don't we wrap up with this question um, which is uh, do the high pressure uh, sorry uh, doesn't the high pressure open surface defects even more uh, ah, okay uh, so uh, it won't actually so you I, I can understand the reasoning you have a surface crack and you have uh, up to 30,000 psi in that crack so the first thought would be that that crack will will be opened by the pressure this is something we have to think about for example when we design our pressure vessels for example but since that whole object is in the hip system, in the hip process, so the, the pressure will act all around that component on all surfaces. So even though you have a high pressure in the crack, you have the same high pressure on the sides of that component that want to close the crack. So you have actually zero net force to even opening or closing that crack uh, in the hip process. Okay, terrific. Well, that's about all the material we have to go over at this time. And uh, thank you, Magnus, for an excellent presentation. And I think the audience enjoyed it, uh, just judging by all the questions we got in. So appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Alan. All righty. And we'd also like to thank you, our listeners, for joining us today. Uh, any questions that come in after this point or questions that we didn't get to will be passed along to Quintus and you can expect a reply via, uh, via email. Uh, the entire webinar, as Tim mentioned, uh, will be available for replay by 4 p.m. Eastern time, and you can access it by using the same sign-in link you used earlier. Uh, and as we've been hearing with increasing frequency, added manufacturing is evolving at a rapid pace. SME, um, SME, 
I'm going to try that one more time. SME Media has many ways of putting you in touch with the latest developments in this area. Uh, for example, the May issue of Manufacturing Engineering, which should be arriving in your mailboxes soon, uh, features two feature articles on additive manufacturing, including a state of the industry report by leading experts at Wohler's Associates, who uh, incidentally will be uh, at RAPID. We also encourage you, as I mentioned, to attend RAPID plus TCT, uh, I should say the leading additive manufacturing exposition. Uh, in North America, and, and that will be held May 20th to 23rd at the Cobo Center in Detroit. And we uh, encourage you to sign up for that conference today. Well, thanks again for everyone for joining us on this SME Media webinar. We hope you found it informative, and please tune in for the next one.